Hey everybody, back again to the Elite Show, another episode this week, I'm John Elite. Did I change my life? Yes, I did. For you people out there, fans and soldiers, click the subscribe button if you like the show. To my right, my co-host Kevin. John, thank you so much. Welcome back to season three of the Elite Show, where we're going to show you how there's much more that brings us together than tears us apart. We're sitting here with two very special guests today. Today's going to be a real fun episode. We're here with Frankie Steele. Okay, I love that name. We're going to talk about nicknames in just a second. And my okay. new friend, Castro Z Zaytano. Yes, sir. Thank Zaytano. You. Yeah. Nice uh, to be here. We have four very individual people at this table. I know two people came from the former lives that uh, are very similar. We don't know each other. I'm a retired police officer. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there's gonna you're going to see how there's more that brings us together and tears us apart. Thank you yes. so much for joining us, John. Oh, thanks for thank having you. us. Thanks for having us. What's thank up, you. brother? Good oh, to see you again. Good to see you, too. We grew up together, the people that don't know out there, yeah. and uh, Cashew. A lot of history. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, of history. history. A lot of decades and decades and decades. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that nickname, Frankie Steele. Okay. <laughs> Frankie Steele. I want to know. It, all, it, I, grew up around, I grew up around that life. Right. And everybody had the coolest nicknames ever, except for the ones that are like Fat Andy. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, it's, that's, that's kind of rough. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the history on the name, because I had two. Really, I had three nicknames in my life. Steel is the longest one. The first one was Tuscan. Going back to the 70s now. Remember Tuscan Pops? Yeah, sure. Buddy yeah, Hackett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yogurt, frozen yogurt pop. Buddy Hackett, love both. Right. So now, I used to always go to the corner store and just walk in, take the whole box, and eat the whole box and say, well, it's diet, so we can eat the whole thing. <laughs> so I got named Tuscan in the 70s. Then when I went to junior high school and high school, and I was playing football from the Utrecht High School, Green Machine, and uh, the coach says, Beef. And then I became Frankie Beef. I wasn't too happy about it, but, you know, it, it is what it is. And then right after that, <clears throat> there was like a couple of th phases where I was in the music industry, and I got into a shootout at the same time I was doing that, and... I ran out of bullets, and I said, I'll never let that happen again. And I always would keep, you know, four, five, six clips, you know, a couple of different pistols and have an array on me at all times. So the guy was like, you like steel. And that's when oh, I that's became what Frankie, Frankie Steele. I never asked you that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. But I got to tell you, it yeah, is Frankie, one of the cooler names yeah, I've Frank, ever heard. Yeah, and that one stuck. So it became the rap name and the, the street name at the same time. <laughs> well, your father had a good name. Yeah. Sammy Cigarettes. Yeah, I like that Sammy name. Sammy Cigarettes. So yeah. People just usually call me asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think my nickname growing up was Pugsley because I was a little fat kid. Yeah. And it's not the most endearing name. I hated that name. Yeah, God, but, see, that. John knows my father since he's a kid. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Like a kid. And yeah, my father got that name because he used to truck cigarettes in the 70s, the early 70s, mid-70s, from North Carolina here. Truck load after truck load after 18 wheelers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when he became Sammy Cigarettes. So, <laughs> hey, yeah. Castro, did you ever have any nicknames growing up? Um, uh, they, when I was young, they used to call me uh, Castro Fidel. Castro Fidel. Yeah, because uh, uh, I was locked up. I was in a... Like when I got locked up when I was young, when I was like fourteen, I was in DFY, Division for Youth. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, I was I, I used to like write rhymes and stuff. And one dude was like, "Man, you should you should name yourself Castro Fidel, man." I said, "I said, nigga, I ain't I ain't, I ain't Cuban. I'm black and Puerto Rican." <laughs> he said, "Yo, but Cat," and then I, from that day on, Castro stuck with me. But later on, as I started evolving and like knowing myself and learning myself, and I, I and I, I was a part of the life. I changed the C to a K and put Zaytana because everybody put Santana because I'm Spanish too. So everybody put Santana, Joel Santana. So I was like, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm different completely from everybody around me. I'm going to put a Z. I'm Zaytana. Do you and speak Spanish still? Nah. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, lived, I, I lived in Cuba for a while. Oh, all right. So I seen your dad. I used to see him. <laughs> Yo, I'm not even Cuban. <laughs> Wait, oh, he changed his name to Trudeau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't get me twisted, though. I, I did used to lie back in the day. He was like, Yo, why, why your name is Cash? I'm Cuban, man. I'm Cuban. Yeah, there you go. But you two grew up together. So how how is it that you guys grew up and ended up on in different families? Now, you were part of the Gambino crew, and you were part of the Colombo crew. Correct. Okay, so how did you separate? Well, here's what happened. My father was Gambino couple of relatives were Gambino and my father you know in the end he ended up doing about 50 almost 51 years holy cow he's like Sonny Francis right but on three to four bids the last bid was 27 years straight 
for a phone call. <laughs> and he was always seeing me in the street and, you know, getting in trouble and trying to steer me away from the life. So he basically blackballed me with the Gambinos. And then I had to make my own path. And that's how I ended up with the Colombos. But that's different than what's going on today from what I understand about the, the way the, the American mafia works. It's who you know, not how you earn. Well, let me tell you something. I knew his father from the streets as a kid, like he said, because he was around, uh, you know, by Tough Tony and Fat Andy when he had the club over there. And Tony Lee. Tony Lee. Mikey and uh, Yeah, Mikey brother. Gallo, his brother. Yeah. So there was under trainer with Anthony Ruggiero's father at that time. And Anthony. Uh, yeah. I, I met him when I was a kid. Yeah. When I was totally different. Like, I'm talking a long, long, long time ago. But I'll tell you, when we're in, we're in Fairton in about 96, and your dad's in there, he's in a machine shop, he used to hang out, stayed away. Listen, his father's a professional doing time. So when I come in there, I go stay with his father. He's got a little radio in there, he's hanging out, I'd sit with him. Jackie Denorcio was with us in those days. Yes. Right? He's a Jersey boy guy from... Mm -hmm. In front funny bastard. There was, was, was a movie. It was a movie about him. Yeah. Oh yeah. When Vin Diesel played Jackie yeah. Denosio. Oh, was that the, the I know. Find me I, guilty. Yeah, find me guilty. Yeah. You had hair in that movie. I think, yeah. Right. Yeah. But your father warned me at that time because they were all into the politics, and he says to me, "Well, because Jackie had a problem at that time with Louis Ricky, little Bobby Brooksy was there in, in those days. Dominic because Sicali was there. I'm trying to think some of the guys. Big Vince from Philadelphia. And as soon as I stepped in, he said to me, "You know they're going to drag you in this." And, you know, he says, so, you know, do yourself a favor. He says, listen to me, just stay busy and stay away from it because you're going to be the guy fighting, which was exactly what happened. I was the one fighting and, and I didn't listen to him naturally. And right. uh, I jumped in for, for Jackie DeNoss. So I like Jack. Jackie was a funny, funny bass. It's one thing about Jackie, <laughs> did good time. But yeah. that's pretty funny because I know, I know your story where your, your father had you around all these different wise guys and that's how they sort of trusted you where, Frankie, you had to sort of make your own way. How difficult was that? Well, it wasn't too difficult because they knew my father. A lot of other families knew my father, so they think I came from good stock. Mm -hmm. And so it made things a little, trustworthy. Yeah, it made things a little easier. And they knew he was in jail in the can all, all the time. And uh, it, 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 they, they like you better when they know some history about you. Mm. You know, the doors are open more freely. They don't have to so vet to you as closely. Yeah, but you still get vetted on all levels. Right. But it's it's like we're coming recommended, mm -hmm. like, you know, reference letter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 You know, so to speak. Yeah. You have good references. Yeah, but reference letter. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about both of you is you're on different families. And I always wanted to notice, and I'm, I know a lot of our listeners want to know this. You have Columbo's, Gambino's, Luc Lucchese, Bonanno, and, and everything else. Was there ever any, any rivalry between your two families? Like, hey, oh, I can't talk to Frankie. He's Colombo. I can't talk to John. He's Gambino. Well, in my lifetime, in my, you know, reign when I was running around, the only time that got like that is during the Colombo War. Mm. When You were part of that Colombo War. Yes, that was the, 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 the beginning of the end. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, during that time, there was a truce. The other families got together and said, there'll be no shooting. And Greg Scarpa didn't want to listen. He wanted blood. And you know, a couple of murders happened. And John Gotti sent a list to all his men and said, you can't mingle or associate or do business with any of these guys on the list. So now that list circulated around. Greg got the list. He wrote John Gotti's name on the list and sent it back. <laughs> You know, so that's a stop. You know, it's a slap in the face. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, because again, Greg, even though he was working for the government for thirty years that we didn't know, he was a mad dog killer, serial type killer type. I think you had said in in, a, in another thing that I watched about you where Greg Scarpa, although he's working for the government, would kill somebody right in front of you. Yeah, whenever it surfaced, like where he was cooperating, like during the war, it came out one day. We were hunting some people down. So he came to the house, you know, with Dunkin' Donuts and says, okay, we're going to kill a few people today. Let's eat first. You know? <laughs> so we're eating donuts, sipping the coffee. And somebody, Carmine and Cesar, walked in that, the, the safe house we were in and put the, the newspaper down. And there it was. Jerry Capici wrote an article about Greg Sr. being a cooperator. Yeah. And the plan of the day was, instead of going to hunt down a region faction members, was to kill Jerry Capici. Yeah. And 
you know, he was really aggravated. We didn't find Jerry Capici, but we found somebody else. So in front of everybody, you know, he did, he killed somebody. And right then and there, it puts you, your mind to sleep saying there's no way this guy's cooperating because he just killed this guy in front of everybody. It puts you to, to you know, a little at ease. Yeah. You know, because, you know, in the car going there, I wasn't in Greg's car. And I was in a different car because, you know, the shooters were in a stolen car following around, you know. So I was talking to my friend in the car as we were going. I'm like, you know, if this guy's, uh, uh, you know, cooperating, you know, we're, we're finished. They're, they're going to put us in jail forever. And then, you know, he kills somebody. And now you, know, you, you think, okay, there's no way in the world this guy killed 50-something people, yeah. if not 100. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in, the, in the end, like when he was sick, in the end, and then the war came, I was convinced this guy wanted to get killed and go out in a blaze of gro glory mm -hmm. instead of AIDS killing him like AIDS did. Yeah. You know? And... Uh, but you're talking about the famous Colombo War, was it between 91 and 93? Carmine right. Persica comes out victorious because who was the other? He went to jail. Right. That's, yeah. Well, basically, Carmine was in jail from the window, from the commission case, right. the Windows case, mm -hmm. it's called, where all the five families get 100 years each, right. you know, all the heads. And he was saving the top spot for his son, Little Alley Boy, to take over when Alley Boy, Little Alley Boy, would get out. And he appointed Vicarina as an acting boss of the family because he thought he could control him. And then John Gotti got in his year. John Gotti got in Joe Scopo's year. And well, Joey Scopo, like, you know, he grew up with Jeannie Gotti since they're best friends since a kid. So when they put these guys in position, Vic goes to prison, to fast forward it, right? Mm -hmm. And then Joey steps in and he takes over as the the new faction of, of boss of the of the Colombo family, until, that faction. Until he was killed. Until he's killed by... You know, Anthony Russo was part of that team. Uh, Rather front was involved in that. This is like the the that Johnny Papa. They don't teach this in Johnny black Papa. history. I'm, I'm learning well, I'm a lot right you. now. <laughs> hey, this is not. This is not. This I, is I'll so tell you something off of that to answer what you said and what he said. So people that understand, we're like baseball team or a football team because you're playing for another team. After the game's over, we all mingle with each other. We all go together. drink together. Yeah. We all have yeah. history with each other. And We're a lot, friends of, with a each lot other. of business deals together. Yeah, business Making deals. Making money is green. Yeah. So it, the, the mob's not about fighting or killing each other. It's about really making money, just what you said. It's right. green. Yeah. So when we're on the street, we're all friends until something. And then you got to remember, no one knows when you're not friends. Mm -hmm. You know, During the war, they knew something was... In other words, a guy will just disappear. People don't know who hit him. And, it's, and everybody goes about drinking and being friends again. And then when we go to prison, we all stay together. Yeah. All that's left at the door, whatever's going on the street, and, and the mob yeah. guys stay together for the most part, unless they're fighting over pasta, Listen, which happens a lot. During <laughs> the war, there was a lot of murders, Yeah, a lot of attempted murders, a, a lot. Yeah, You know, like 15, 18 murders, and dozens and dozens and dozens of attempted murders. And one of the guys who I knew well, who I tried to kill, when I got locked up, they put me in the cell with him. Yeah. <laughs> so now I, I'm walking the cell with my bedroll, and I'll tell you who it is. It's Chicky, Chicky oh, really? DiMartino. Oh, okay. Who I, I, yeah. I love the guy. He was yeah. a great guy. And I walked in the cell, and I was like, I turned around. I thought they made a mistake. And he was like, oh, what's up, Steel? Give me a big hug. Oh, happy to see you. And then he goes, the first thing he says, he goes, listen, on the street, that was business. Now everything is, is good. Right. Now we have to fight for our lives with these cases. Yeah. You know? So, again, he's still in jail. Hopefully he gets out one day. You know, it's a crazy life that people really don't understand. Yeah. Like That's what I'm saying. This is, it's so, it, you can't make sense out of something that don't make sense. But we understand it because we grew up in it. Does, if you try to make sense of what we're saying, like he just said, I was going to kill the guy. And then he says it the same sense. What a great guy. And then, you know, we go on to what, that's our lives. Well, Listen, and I, and I, ha and I, I yeah. had him, John, I had him yeah. in the street. And right before, I was out the car window with a shotgun. And all of a sudden, his daughter's head popped up in the front seat. Yeah. And I gave him a salute and we left. Right. You know? Well, so it's he, amazing that most people can't separate business from pleasure. All right? So the fact that he said it's business actually yeah. humanizes him a lot more. Yeah. But you guys are in that life and you have families and you have children and you, you, you have people who care about you. Because at the end of the day, here's what I found out about people in that life. Your sons, your fathers, 
your brothers, your friends. And that's how I always saw them. They were my coaches. They were the, the, my friends' fathers. There, there is a human aspect to them that people seem to forget. And, you know, the, and one of the things I want to, I want to ask everybody here, because Castro, you did some time as well. Yeah. When you were in that type of lifestyle, what was, what was it like? Was there anxiety about the fear of arrest, something looming over? Because you know this life has an expiration date. Well, not so much a fear of arrest because when you're in this life, you know you're going to jail yeah, one day. Right. You know, and it's an amazing life. You know it. You know it. You know, it's just a matter of when. And again, a normal day for, for a street guy, you know, before you leave your house, you probably committed four felonies. <laughs> just getting yourself together to get to, yeah. to leave the house, yeah. arming yourself, you know, not even, you didn't even get to lunch yet. Right. You know, by the end of that day, you committed numerous felonies, for, and that's every day. It becomes natural. So do you ever, do, does, it, does it ever weigh on you at all? Um, I tell you what, the most intense time of my life in that life was during the war. The things that were going on on a daily basis was just crazy. And I, and I, I look back at it, and i like, how did I get myself involved to put myself involved in this predicament I'm in? around a maniac yeah. that had a license to kill. And we're all learning from this guy since we're young, you know, and we think that's the way to be. Meanwhile, he had like a license to do what he was doing because he was never going to jail. Mm -hmm. And he had the best of boat worlds. Everybody else that learning from him thought that was the way. Yeah. So technically he was breeding a bunch of lunatics, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. And, and, and for know? the people that don't know, <laughs> which we know, it was a different era. Yes. You know, back today, you know, you know, to me, I keep saying the same thing. The guys now, whether they're tough or not, is a joke compared to back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, because there was consequences for every move. Every time you left that house, if you went and stepped out the wrong way or spoke out of line, you're getting killed. Yeah. You, you know, now that doesn't go on. But back then, it's a serious life. So all the fakers, <clears throat> they all took to, they stood to the side. Because they knew, you disrespect the guy, they're not going to probably tell you about it. You rob the wrong guy, they're not going to tell you about it. You're just going to get hit. Mm. You're gonna, and, and you're going to disappear or you're going to yeah, be left you, in the street You're going to be bed. quietly murdered yeah. and disappeared. Well, you, Francesi was a Colombo so as well. Like that, no Sonny? So, no. No, uh, Michael. Michael? Yes, he was. I never met him, but I heard about his whole racket in the gas tax scams for years. That was like right. a big thing. How this guy made big, big, big money. Right. And But his father I knew. Oh, you knew, yeah, you yeah, knew yeah. Sonny? Yeah, I was in, I was in prison with him. God, he, he told me the basis with Pinochle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pinochle's a fun game, though. Yeah, double deck. You know, he was like a genius. Well, there was a race between his father and Sonny who was going to do more time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Sonny, yeah. I think Sonny lasted to about 103. Yeah, he went in, what do you call that, a Centaurian or something? When yeah, he passed yeah. 100? Yeah. 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 So uh, I'll uh, never see that day. A guy, Well, a guy a guy in that lifestyle, apparently, from what I read about Sonny, he was, he was a tough bastard. And here's he lasted what, that long. Here's what I give it. Guys who do a lot of time, you get like preserved. Like when my father <laughs> got out, like he died at 85 because he killed himself. And I'll tell you how that. He didn't commit suicide, but I'll go through that. But he had a full head of hair. He was 85 years old. He looked like he was like 60 tops, 64. Right. You know, preserved. All those years, not drinking, not like doing anything. You're not staying out all night. You're not, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're not you know, abusing so, yourself. So that's why Sonny Francis can go past 100. If my father didn't like to drink when he got out, he was lost because all his friends were dead. He only had a very little friends left. So he, his, his day would be go to the nearest bar, try to pick up the youngest girl, get drunk. It's my hero. And then drive home. It's a perfect life. I can't blame the guy. Okay. I don't blame him okay. perfectly. Oh, you two, you two yeah. seem to have gotten out okay. I mean, you don't have a wrinkle on your face, Frankie. Yeah. Hey John, look at this guy. Yeah. I, 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 he's the he, Listen, he I know he's got good. the vampire gene in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 He don't he's age, yeah. Well, he drinks, he drinks, yeah. he has to drink. Uh, the Omnicron. Yeah, the Omnicron yeah. uh, blood. Baby's yeah. blood or something, right? I need a gallon of that right now. It's the black chicks. But, um, you know, everybody knows I talk <laughs> about equality on this show, so <laughs> there's more than brings us say. together and right. tears yeah. us apart. I hate anybody who's racist. See, that's so, right. You know, right. I, I notice that the guys who do like, you know, 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50, and they, if they do make it out, or even the ones that are in jail who've been in, like I've been, 
you know, when I was 22 years old, I was, boom, right in Lewisburg Penitentiary. I was the youngest guy in that prison mm. when I got there. And you got guys that were in there for 30 years, 40 years. G great shape. Bionic, on the weight pile. Bionic, yeah, yeah. you know? And the best the best guys in shape were all the dope fiends. Yeah, I, know I don't know how. To, always. I don't, I don't I, know how. Yeah, that's one thing I don't how? know how. Well, was, how is heroin either. a steroid? Listen, I don't understand. Listen, I used to do burpees with him. And uh, use Joe McGay when he was on the street, right? He, he was, uh, uh, you know, he fucked around with heroin like crazy. He'd do burpees all day. He used to do burpees with me. I'm like, how is this guy doing a couple thousand burpees like this? Mm -hmm. You know, not like, you know, so, and, and you just heard me right because somebody says, oh, they're full of shit. They didn't do burpees like that. We did 2,000 push-ups yeah. a day. We did 2,000 burpees a day, split sessions. Yeah. And Joe would hit 2,000 straight sometimes. He'd stay there for whatever hours, Damn. four yeah. hours, three hours, two hours, and hit him. And they do Listen, it on account. I used to sit there and watch from across the yard, the dope fiends working out. <clears throat> And it almost made me want to do heroin. Yeah. And I'm not a junkie. Yeah. I never did a drug in my yeah. life, but it was making them skinny and bionic. Yeah, yeah. It's true. To that point, I've seen pictures of you. And I, I've actually commented on one of the pictures of you. You're, like, shredded. I don't understand how you can be in prison and be that shredded. He'll tell you I worked out day yeah. and night. No, That's all I did. He worked out. He'd run miles. Yeah. Damn. And I was just sitting there and watching him run around, <laughs> run around, run around. And I'm just hating myself. I'm just running around. But I, listen, I lost a lot of weight in prison. Gained it all back when I got out. Yeah. But uh, I went from like 340 pounds to 190. No People shit. thought I was dying. <laughs> you know, he's got cancer. I said, no, I just went on the Atkins. <laughs> but, but The Lewisburg Atkins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, who, who don't like a diet? You could eat pepperoni all you want and cheese. <laughs> pepperoni and cheese until you throw up. You know? That's a great diet. I love Mr. Atkins. Yeah. So we're going out for pepperoni and cheese Yeah. Today. Well, he'll tell you, we, we got pepperoni and cheese and anything else we wanted in one prison we were in later yeah. on, Allenwood. Listen, we... we Actually, they did a... It was on 2020, I believe. They did a show on The Sopranos about us. Yeah. And uh, you explained it. I mean, we destroyed that prison, actually. Well, well here's how it started with me. All right, first of all, Let's just get the backstory first. Yeah. Do we have time for the backstory? Yeah, go ahead. All right. In 1992, in MCC, there was an associate warden, and her name was Susan Galinsky. <laughs> yeah. Hope you're watching. Yeah, so do I. I hope you're watching. So she was an associate warden. And she was a drunk, by the way, for people yeah. that don't know. <laughs> for years, I had some ill will towards her, but I would like to see her right now just have a drink with her. You know, <laughs> but let's go back up. So now it's 1992. We're in, I'm in MCC, and again, back then MCC was a loose place. If you had money, you can get whatever you want. And one day, on a visit, one of the Chinese guys we hung out with, he gives me a list that's in Chinese, and he goes, "Give this list to your sister." Go to this address on the list in Chinatown. Give it to my family member. Let them give all that stuff to your sister. Make your sister bring it in. And there was a way we were getting the food in, you know, with the cops. And at that time, you know, John Gotti was there. Gas pipe came afterwards. So the money was nonstop. You know, we were eating stuff that was made in Little Italy an hour ago. And we were eating it fresh wow. in the cell. You Mike Dow was the prison guard? <laughs> no. <laughs> Mike Dow was on the other floor. But... It got to the point, it's all, so now my sister takes this list, she gets all this stuff, and on the visit, she's like, listen, Frankie, there was like some dead stuff in there. I couldn't see what it was. It was wrapped up with some type of animals. So now I get the stuff, and I didn't open it yet. I'm all right here, shake down. So now the cops are going to come shake down all the cells. So now I got these these things wrapped up, and like look, they look like little, like, Something like an alien. You know the alien babies in the alien ship? They're wrapped up like an alien, like an alien from the movie. So I cut one open with my tuna fish can because I got the tuna fish can bent. So that's my like Ginsu knife. I cut it open and I'm looking at this bloody thing. So then I see the head of this bird. So I grabbed the, 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 the head. So I shake it. All of a sudden just, it unfolded. And there it was flapping. It was a duck. Okay, with the big duck feet. What? And I had two of them. So now... They're coming to shake down. They want us out of the cell. So I'm taking the tuna can and I'm dissecting the duck and I'm flushing it down. Oh, okay. So I get one duck down, but there's blood everywhere. Okay. <laughs> so now I got the other duck and I'm trying to cut it with. The, I look like a, like a mass murderer in the cell, right? And I'm cutting the duck with the tuna can. It was I, 
No, no, it was dead. Oh, it had oh, no right. feathers. It was bloody. Oh. It was just wrapped up like a cocoon. <laughs> I was even alive. It's gonna breathe. They said, yeah, that's what they said. Like, like, like the Chinese. The Chinese wanted more duck. Yeah, yeah. So now, I get the other duck and I get it almost down, and whoosh, I flush it. Now I'm waiting. I hear blah 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 blah. All of a sudden, the foot came flying up and was looking right at me. So now, I try to get it again and flush. Now they pull me out of the cell because I'm taking way too long. They need to search. I never made it back to that cell. <laughs> Damn. All right. I heard my name. Patillo, office. So now I go to the office. And the, the CEO says, listen, you got to go down to the, the lieutenant wants to speak to you. So now I said, all right. So now I said, okay, I'm going to go to the hall. I'm definitely going to the hall for this. So I go downstairs. I'm thinking they found the pasta and the garlic and some other stuff, the normal stuff. Right. Not, I don't think the duck, you know, was there. I thought the body was gone. Right. <laughs> okay. So now I go downstairs. I walk into the lieutenant's office. It's Susan Galinsky and the lieutenant and another officer. So now I see this stack of all spaghetti, you know, all the chico pasta and spaghetti and linguine, heads of garlic. And then I see it. I caught it. I, I didn't see it at first when I walked in. And there it is on the table, the duck foot. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It's a complete web. All right. With the little body, with the little piece yeah, of duck yeah. on it, a little leg left. So I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh. So now, the the the, the lieutenant's looking at me with a smile because he's ready to burst out laughing. Because when he sees I see that, he knows. <laughs> I, so, but he's on the payroll too. Right. But Susan Galinsky, she's not. Yeah. So now she's like, so where'd you get this from? Where'd you get that from? And where'd you get the chicken? <laughs> I says, the chicken? The chicken came from downstairs from the mess hall. It was sent up. It's a chicken. And I and I took the I took my hand, I poop, and I slapped the, the foot across the desk into the little bucket, right? And they was, you're going to the hall. I said, okay. So now they they cuff me. I'm going away to the hall. Now the lieutenant gets up that was trying to keep a you know straight face. And he says, She's a fucking moron, right? Yeah. A chicken. Anybody knows it's a duck. Yeah. I was like, yeah. So now I go, I go to the hole. I get back out of the hole. It, it, there's like nothing happened. Nothing even happened. I get back out a few days later. I go back to the tier. They got the whole thing out again. Stuff from Denoy. Right. It's all cooked nice. Linguine, clams, everything. Lobster tails, shrimps. Damn. Shrimps the size of my hand. They, they're drinking like uh, the Louis the Thirteenth. It's just, it's just pure insanity. Now, I get sent off to Lewisburg. This is 1993. Now, I go to Lewisburg. My level drops to a medium. So, I went from maximum security to medium security. So wait, wait, This was a maximum security prison? You're getting all this good stuff in there? No, no. That was That's MCC. That was, okay. MCC. That was the mm -hmm. Metropolitan Correctional Center okay. where you wait pretrial you before get you get sentenced. Mm -hmm. So, at that time, John Gotti, he went to Marion. Uh, gas pipe flipped, and he, was dis he disappeared. And a couple of the big money guys disappeared. So now we're back to ramen noodles and tuna. And now I go to Lewisburg. So now that's 93. I stay in Lewisburg to 98. And now my level drops. They did a whole different reevaluation. So I went from maximum security to medium security. So now they're going to send me to the prison with my father. The judge recommended it. So now I'm going to go see my father. And I'm going to be with him now. You know, I haven't seen him, you know, for a long time on the street. He was always in jail. So now I'm going to get to hang out with my father in jail. I was happy. I'm thinking I'm going to Fairton Prison. They sent me to Cumberland, Maryland. Now, I was in Cumberland, Maryland for a couple of years, and then they did the re-system again, and I got reevaluated. And that's how I ended up at Allenwood. Yeah. So now, I have no idea. Now, remember the, the woman I told you, Susan sure. Galinsky, right? Okay. She was an associate warden in MCC in 93, 92, uh -huh. 91. After associate warden, what's the next level you go to? Warden. Exactly. So now I don't notice. And when you come into any prison, when you walk it in R&D, there's pictures on the wall of who the hierarchy is. Like, you know, the mall picture has the boss, the concierge, the underboss. Well, they have that in the, in the lobbies of all the prisons of who's who. I didn't look. I wasn't looking at that. I was just happy to be, I'm going to be with my friends. Everybody's here, you know? I didn't even put my bedroll on the bunk. The cop came to me and says, Pontillo, the warden wants to see you. I go, all right. Yeah, in, in the cafeteria. It was lunchtime. So I go to the mess hall. I walk in the mess hall, and I spotted her. And she spotted me. like we, Our eyes locked at the same time, and she went like this. Okay? 
I don't want to see this lady. I don't want to be in the same prison with this lady. She goes, hey, Steele, like that. Hey, Steele. I'm like, hi, Miss Galinsky. She goes, this is my place. I run this. I says, what do you mean? She goes, I'm the warden here. Now, you know, like in the, like in a movie where your stomach just drops. Like, <laughs> All right. And I was like, oh, man. Yeah. To myself. I'm like, I'm done. Yeah, she goes, well, listen. She goes, you're not going to turn my prison into a circus. And I'm watching you. Anything you do, I'm going to know. Wow. I said, you're not even going to hear out a peep out of me. I'm on Hollywood mode now. I'm a screenwriter. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. You had the screen. You were right. I forgot it. You were yeah. writing movies yeah. while we were in there. Yeah. I learned how to write movies from a real screenwriting professor. Yeah, yeah. Who actually was addicted to cocaine and strippers. <laughs> so when he would teach his class at the college, during lunch, he'd go rob a bank. <laughs> got caught. So I, I learned how to write screenplays from him. So by the time I got to that prison, I told her I was on movie mode. I says, I'm writing movies now. I'm a screenwriter. You're not going to know I'm here. Little did I know, within a week, she had an FBI investigation on me just to watch me because there was corrupt things going on there. Now I go back to the, the block and I start mingling with all my friends I haven't seen for years. Guys I grew up in the street, guys I haven't, you know, it was, it was like the whole neighborhood was here. It was great. Yeah. Everybody from the neighborhood yeah, we was were in, all there. there were, everybody we, from Brooklyn, Long Island, Jersey, Queens, Manhattan. Should have told Bronx, you you were writing a movie about how to smuggle, the Philly smuggle guys, stuff hey, in the prison. All the Philly yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah all the Philly, yeah, yeah, all the Philly guys. So Whip. everybody it was like a great crew. You know? It was just so many guys and it was just laughing every day and working out. You know, it was just a great time. And they had all the cops on the payroll. So that's all I had to hear. So now I'm like, okay. I haven't had Genoa salami in a while. I need about five pounds of it. You know, <laughs> you know, I haven't had lobster, keto. Yeah. Right. I haven't had lobster tails in so long. I need a dozen. And I told my friend, I says, you know, Eddie, you know, Eddie Rendini, yeah. I says, you got the guy in Brooklyn, Coluccio, on, on 60th Street, the distributor with all this stuff. He goes, Yeah. I go, we need to make a few packages. You know, and before you knew it. All the cops were bringing everything oh, we had in. The whole jail. All of us had guys. Yeah. Cell phones, I mean, food. You guys it, are selling a pretty it, good deal listen, for prison. Listen, it got oh, it got I to the point. Movie out there. Listen, it got to the point. Not even no joke. Every infomercial that I was watching at nighttime, like for different products, I was ordering it through the cop. How about Miguel? Miguel was getting steroids. He was dirty. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He was, he he was, was red. Like as, he was red as that car. Yeah, he was, he was red as that car. We're telling him, listen, mm. they're going to know what you're doing. Yeah. You're being yeah. red. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the middle of winter. Everybody looks like they could model a coffin. Yeah, yeah. And this guy was red as the flag. <laughs> he's he's benching old, 150. Up. He's yeah. benching like 350. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, I, when I was a kid, the staple for me was to come downstairs, pour myself a bowl of cereal, put that cereal box right in front of me, and read the box. And it was great. I did it every single morning. As I got older, I realized all the garbage that was in those cereals, the sugar, the chemicals. I didn't want to take away that staple to my children. So I had to seek out healthy alternatives. And Magic Spoon answered that. Well, I had a similar experience because of my father. He always wanted us eating healthy with vitamins and working out. And when Magic Spoon stepped in, they are, it's tasty and it's very healthy for you. There's no sugars. And it's uh, low calorie, and it's everything I'm looking for, for a healthy cereal for me and my family. Well, you know, a lot of people like to cut carbs these days. I think there's like four net grams of carbs in there. So if you're looking for a healthy lifestyle alternative, but you don't want to give up all the good stuff, that's where Magic Spoon comes in. Magic Spoon, zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories per serving. They're also keto-friendly, gluten-free, Grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it backed it with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. So click the link below and use the code ELITE for $5 off. Also, for my Canadian and British fans, Magic Spoon is shipping to Canada and the UK. So he's doing the steroids. It got to the point where I wanted to see my file. My central file. Yeah, yeah. So we had the cop get my central file. Now back then it really wasn't computers and everything. It was they had computers, but it was a hard file that followed you through your whole bid. So I was like, you know, I don't want to say his name because he probably has a normal job now. 
They're probably retired, right? They're all retired. They gotta be. All right, his name was Mark James. You had all Mark right. James, we had Swinefoot. Yeah. We had, uh, no, Swinefoot was a good guy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah Swinefoot was a good guy. Flash was up. Flash is the one that yeah. later on gets caught. And he, yeah. he calls me up and tries to wire up on the phone. I knew right away. I go, yeah. I ain't getting on that phone. I know I'm done here. So, so I, I says, I says, look, I want to see my crazy. file. So I go to the office. He hands it to me in a bag. Now I take it in my laundry bag. I go to my cell, and I'm reading what they know about me now. So now it's like I got the CIA file on Frankie Steele, and I'm looking at the pages. And I'm like, I don't think this should be in here. I start ripping the pages out of the file that I don't want now. So I'm cleaning my own file. All right, I, I went from maximum security to like a camp. I was just ripping all this <laughs> stuff out, all the bad stuff, and then I'm starting seeing who my separatees were. Yeah, you know, you see all these names that you're not supposed to, and it was just a wild time. So between the file. And then infomercials, like, I saw stuff for a juicer. Remember when I, ha I had the juicer? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Okay, so now... This is, this is Bro, absolute insanity. Listen, Bro, you had a juicer? Listen, I got a juicer. I never used the juicer in my life. So I got the guy in the kitchen bring me carrots. I go, I want a lot of carrots. He brings, like, a garbage bag. Literally, <laughs> like, a garbage bag of carrots. So now I had to wait for the good cop to come on. So now I got carrots, apples, this and that. So everybody knows I got this thing. So now everybody's got their cups ready to go. So all you heard, all right, for an hour straight, was me in the, in the cell going, <laughs> so, right? so I'm, I'm making all this juice, right? Now, at this particular thing, it was pods. So we had one commute, one bathroom with, with four toilets, okay? So everybody, I got like 50 guys have juice. We're drinking it like it's the best thing ever, okay? <laughs> Within an hour, Everybody's all you heard was flushing. <laughs> Everybody's lined up. <laughs> who's shitting their pants? <laughs> who's not making it? Who's writing? Who's doing a fight? And it's not a fight. It's water. <laughs> all right. So I blew out the whole block with the juicer the first time we used it. Yeah. The whole block was done. Oh, I'm going. Yeah. To, that's it. You guys yeah. got me convinced. Listen, we, <laughs> going away. We, we bring in sperm kits to get you know people's wives pregnant on the street. We did everything. Actually, I mean it was insane what it was we did. The, the cryo. She didn't have to control us. No, the, the the warden knew what was going on, but it was just it was insane because she didn't know what cops were really doing it until they sent an infiltrator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, and the infiltrator got us good. Oh yeah. So, so besides. Like there was crazy products. Like like I was watching this thing. The the ladies on there. Yeah, you could trim the hair in your nose and just go with the little machine. So I'm, I'm like, I gotta have that. You know, because I'm using a twit, a little small like scissor. Now I don't know that you're not supposed to take the metal thing off. So I was like, because he didn't bring the box or the instructions. So I got this little lipstick thing, right? I pulled the metal thing off and I'm looking at it and it's a razor blade spinning, right? I'm like, I'm like. That's supposed to go on your nose? <laughs> What's the safety barrier on this thing? So now Kevin says, just stick it in your nose. I bled for four days. Listen, I, I needed stitches, really. I needed stitches. I, I, I had a sock up my nose so it was like just to stop the blood for four days. Oh, she, hey, she, she, listen, she tortures us after that. Oh. You have much great escape? Oh, yeah, yeah, Steve yeah. McQueen, you're sure. always going to the hole. I was in yeah. the hole, I had it all back yeah. to the hole. I was, I was in a hole right. for whatever. But I go home from the hole. She four points me. Remember I was telling you about? Yeah, she yeah, four yeah, yeah, points yeah, yeah. me. Then she chains me to the guard's chairs in the hole because I'm sick. And she won't send me out. She won't send me out to, to, to get medical attention. These guys, so I'm, so I'm sick. She won't send me out. She's got me chained like a dog in my underwear to the guard. Whoever's the guard on duty, I'm chained to him. But I go home. When I go home, these guys are now, are now, me. now he's home. <laughs> now it's on. <laughs> now we get oh, he, go home? he yeah, goes home. He goes home from the now hole. He's meeting the guards, yeah. oh, bringing the packages. The but yes. they, they got us. So they got us on video. Yeah. Yeah. They got You're us a screenwriter. Up, yeah. You're a screenwriter. Yeah. Why the hell aren't you writing this one? Because uh, yeah. this is this freaking hilarious. Listen, it, it was so crazy. It was. The things that they were bringing in and the things that I was cooking in the microwave was just crazy. It was a good time until the day where I heard my name. Yeah. <laughs> and Pontillo, lieutenant's office, on the loudspeaker. So I'm like, oh, okay. And then as I was coming out of the block, I saw all different Italians, all handcuffed, going to the, the lieutenant's office. And that was the day of the end. When you guys all went to, they go go to the hall. I'm getting phone calls. Anybody would have vowed, because I left from the hall. I was in over about a year. When Damn. I leave from the hole, these guys are all going to the hole, and I get that phone call, and I go, oh, we're done. Maybe two weeks, three weeks later, 
they raid my property. Like Damn. 10, 12, 15 agents. And it's five, you know, you the time home? they come. Yeah. I'm home. Yeah. But yeah. it's five in the morning to roll over my property. They raided you for jail shit? Yeah. So they well, he was meeting the cop. I'm meeting oh. the cop. And so a video in it. Yeah. Oh, so shit. when they raid my house, I'm thinking they got me for Rico murders, this, that, the other thing. So when it, when it's they for a fucking up, juicer. So I went, listen, <laughs> we're not really doing anything bad. It's yeah. just it's juicer, it's food, what, oh, it's sperm so, kids. Compared, <laughs> it's it ain't like drugs or nothing like that. Compared to what we used to do. Oh yeah. This is like not even a crime. Yeah, yeah. But they take it seriously. They call it bribing a public official. Yeah. So when they when they come and and they got me all locked up, I I I'm not even thinking. I think it's something real serious. There's too many people, and I said to them, "What am I getting charged with anyway?" And when they told me that, I was relieved. I'm thinking I'm getting hit with bombs. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you how it went. It went like this. So listen. So what am I here for? <laughs> listen. We know it was you that was bringing in them carrots in that big black bag. <laughs> no, he was the rest he, of the stuff. He, 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 was, he was the sperm kits and, oh, the, yeah, sperm and the lobster I was the tails. Sperm, oh, oh, was and the sperm lobster kits. Sperm kits, lobster tails, Having and bottles of wine. That's they what I was They weren't no, preloaded, were they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wait, what was no. the sperm kits for? To have a kid. One of our friends wanted to have a kid because yeah. he got like 15, 20 years. Yeah. With his wife? With his wife. And they didn't have, in the feds, you can't. No, no, you don't get conjugals. No. Oh, shit. So I was getting the sperm kits. You know what I did? I would bring my kids up, and they go to lizard zoos and everything. And I had a custom van. A friend of mine was involved too, and he was, so we'd bring a custom van. And I'd make a little like trip for my kids. Mm -hmm. so I go to the thing. I spend the day with them while they fill up the sperm kits. When the the, the cop that's working that we have finishes his shift, his shift. he brings it he back brings out it to me. Yeah. I freeze it and I drive it into the sperm banks in New York. Oh, so now so, they say so. Me. Technically, so you, you know, that, yeah, I would that's a business right see, there. Yeah. I would get it from the cop. Yes. The kid, yeah. give it to who wants it, then get it from who wants it back to the cop, back to John. So technically, I held the kid first. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. Technically. You, you know how I knew I was in trouble too? Charlie Ray, right? This is the guy that's infiltrated. That, that was the infiltrator. He's the infiltrator. His father lives in Kentucky, and they want to do a, a dump in, in Kentucky besides this. So he's trying to set me up for a serious bit. You know, this guy, Charlie Wright. Mm. So when I'm calling the house to talk okay. to his father about going to, to see him, and they said they have some politicians that are going to work with me, blah, blah, blah. The, the father's new wife starts tipping me on the phone. Something's wrong. And I'm like, why is she doing this? And she was trying to tell me. So then one day, finally, I don't know how she did it. She got me to call another number. And when I called it, she goes, don't call anymore. They're trying to set you up. Mm. And she hung up, and I don't know why she let me know, but she let me know. And I'm like, oh, this guy's forget about the sperm and all that nonsense and, and the lobster. That's nothing. They were trying to get me on, you know, a life sentence with this with politicians. I guess they had a politician that was dirty. They got him. He was setting the guy. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the technical besides so the rest of that was. The mm -hmm. aftermath of this whole ordeal of the circus that we turned Susan Belinsky's prison into. Hi, Susan. And Susan, I ended Susan up doing, chained me to those chairs. Susan, Susan, listen, that wasn't a nice thing. It, she did a lot to us. Yeah, she, she did. She, she put us she in her, 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 us. her dungeon and just forgot about us. Well, you guys got a yeah. lot worse because yeah. I got home yeah. after a year. You yeah. guys stayed no, there. I had to stay in the hole for 36 months. And after 36 months, I got put on a Con Air airplane. Remember the movie Con Air? Sure. Okay, that's real. I was on that for four months. My feet never touched the ground. You were fucking playing for four months? Yeah. No, I would come off at night, oh. walk on the slinky into the, the jail that comes right on the tarmac, and then the next day wake up and go back on the slinky, back on, and get on the plane. And the, the pilots are military pilots. They used to fly in, you know, fighter jets, F-16. So now you learn firsthand what a jumbo jet can actually do. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And I'm not even joking. Yeah. It, it got to the point where I was praying we crashed <laughs> just to get off. Because every day when you take off, it's a straight run. And then all of a sudden it's like this, the space shuttle. Straight up. You don't even know what a jumbo jet could do. This, and you're going straight in the sky like you're in a, like a, a ride, like a roller coaster ride. Damn. And these pilots are probably giggling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We're gonna They're all strapped in. Eating Krispy Kreme. I didn't know what Krispy Kreme was until it was on the plane, you know. And I was looking at the box and they were eating it, and oh, she hammered you guys. And and, and they're all strapped in the first time. I was like, oh, these guys, what, what, what? They're strapped in like they're going to NASA, like something from NASA. And now I know why, because we're not strapped in. We're just with we're, we're chained, belly chained, black boxed, so you really can't yeah, move, yeah. and then chained to the floor. Oh man! So we have some playroom. 
So when they're doing these crazy maneuvers with the jumbo jet, you feel it. You got to do it like the vomit comet where they train the Listen, astronauts. I, I, at, at the first week, I was ready to throw up. <laughs> I got used to it because you remember, I, w- I was mobile. I was I was inside a hole for all these years. Right. I didn't even move. I was walking. That when I first was taking my steps, my whole feet got black and blue, mm. just for walking. You know. Well, you brought up a name that I wanted to talk about. So you brought up Gas Pipe Casso. Yeah. All right. So Gas Pipe, he's in prison. He flips. All right. I wasn't there for the flipping. I was there for when he first got locked up. We heard on the radio that gas pipe got locked up, and all of a sudden, boom, he just popped up on 11 North, right. 11 South, in MCC. And uh, at the time, Greg Scarpa was locked up. He just got locked up because he just got his eye shot out. So now we have Greg Scarpa looking like Freddy Krueger with no eye, with one eye missing, with a piece of ass skin sewn in here, with a little drain valve. Ass- okay, ass- yeah, skin. with a piece of ass skin. That, that, that was what they put for his eye, because he got his eye shot out a couple of like, weeks before. And so now it's 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 Greg Scarpa. And all of a sudden, I was like, Greg, they just locked up gas pipe. Oh, yeah? Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll put it on our floor. <laughs> sure enough, here he comes. Yeah. It, 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 like the speak of the devil. Yeah. He was popping up, and now we have gas pipe. And then it only took him a matter of time to get the cops on the payroll, because money was no object to him. Right. You know, He was just sending $50,000 bundles to cops and say, okay, now... I'll tell you what I need. You know, his brother had a restaurant. I used to go to his brother's restaurant, Frio. And I met him from our other friend, Frankie, who, who knew him. And so we'd go in and see him, his brother. Brother's some businessman, actually. He ran a good restaurant, a pizzeria restaurant, but a nice spot. Right. And then his steps, his uh, illegitimate son, Anthony, was in touch with me for a while. And he would hang around and, you know, you'd hear some crazy stories. I mean, he's another guy. That was, that's why when Sammy's talking bullshit about gas, but come on, everybody was petrified of the guy. The guy was a, was a beast when he was on the street killing and, and whatever he was doing. He was no dummy, he had a ton of money. Yeah. So when they're talking about, you know, when Sammy said something about, oh, this guy was a dummy, he was no fucking dummy. Far from it. You know, he, you know maybe not book smart, but smart. There's a there's way there's two different types of, dummies of intelligence. Money. Dummies don't keep their money. You're right? Yeah. yeah. But... Right? Yeah. With with somebody like Gaspipe, who's just from what I understand a stone cold killer, and he flips, and there there's this code of silence inside that life that I'm sure everybody here is well aware of. We've seen it in movies a thousand times. You guys lived it. What's the is that is that a myth or is that reality? It, you want to answer that? Well, no, you can start it. I'll, I'll uh, finish it. In the old days, it was a reality. Now it's a myth. Because what happened was after Rico comes in, and I've done this on so many shows, you have Joe Messina wearing a wire. Yeah. You have 15 of his captains all right, the whole Bonanno family. Later Al, on after Al the Diarco. wars, Al Diarco, Al Diarco goes. the boss. B- b- boss of the Lucchese family, he goes. Sammy Gravano, he goes. Junior goes in. It started the trend. Junior it started the trend. And he's making meetings with the government. So he goes. You got all his captains, Mikey goes, they're going. You have the whole Colombo family after the wars, they all start going, and you got guys that are undercover, like you just said, Greg Scarper, and you know, and then you, you know, so you got every family. You got Chucky Porter in Pittsburgh that's going. You have the guys in Chicago that went. You have, you know, so you, as you go through this, you have Whitey Bulger with the Irish crew. He goes. So where is this nonsense of 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 the old life? The problem is people live off of the movies and the old life that don't exist in the new life. Because things evolve, and when things evolve and people are getting hit with two and three hundred years, it's over. Right. You know, you, you, it's not the same government, it's not the same system, it's not the same laws. So when you could go in and take a boss, and they're telling guys to wear their underwear to get straightened out. Now, the guy that's getting straightened out should tell the boss, well, you get your underwear too, because you guys are wearing wires. And Joe Messina yeah. was very lucky, Damn. because after the yeah. Donnie Brasco... Yeah. Fiasco. He, he, the Bananos are the only ones that survived because they got kicked off the commission, yeah, and so they did, they were outside of the commission case. But w- at what point during your involvement <clears throat> did you start to see this myth and say, you know what, I've had enough? Well, after you do a big bid, you, you, you know, once you go to jail and you're there a few years and you realize that the thing you believed in this life and how the love, the respect. The honor is what gives you the drive to be a part of it. And then when you go to prison, you see there is no love, respect, and honor. You're forgotten about. Unless you have big money before you go to prison, like in the movies, they think they take care of everybody. They don't. 
It's like you're forgotten about. And that puts a little bad taste in your mouth. And as years pass, you see things a lot differently than you did when you were on the other side of the bar. When you're on these side of the bars looking out, it's a totally different life. Well, and I'm going to tell you why also. If you watch the, in the Army, in the wars, guys go into this thing at a young age <clears throat> when they sign up to it, go to war. It. No, 17, going. 18, 19, 20, mm -hmm. because we're very easy to manip mm -hmm. maneuver. We'll kill, we'll do whatever you want because we're looking up to guys, just like guys do for the Army. They, they think it's glor you know glorified because you watch too many movies. But then when you see the act actual action and, you, and guys are coming home we're not coming home. We're coming home without legs and arms and, and well, limbs. And, and the real the real world hits effect. Then it starts changing. I mean, there's some real guys that just totally believe in this life. Yeah. There's some. There's still few diehard yeah. people. I mean, just there. recently. Even in this day and I'll age. tell you, even now, you have a guy, Patty De La Russo. I don't know if you know who I that know is. him. I know okay, him. You know I, know. I was with him. I, I was him. very good friends with him. Yeah. All right. I was, you know, I know him since we were kids. And, you know, I like him. Right, it was a very likable guy. Yeah, very like intelligent. Number good things to say okay. with him. And you know, they say that he he got a position with the Lucchese family, right? Now, the old days, you got to get killed to get out, right? Well, you're mm -hmm. not getting out now. He's another guy who wasn't feeling well. He had cancer at one time. He did. Okay. He had leukemia. Yeah, I ran he had, into. He had a port. Yeah, back in the day, yes. I remember. And he he's retired. And you know, and and I wasn't sure at first is he really retired or is he not retired? He's retired because I ran into a couple of people. I grew up with him. With me, I grew I, another one of Eddie. I don't know if you met Eddie Hannon back then. He was Patty's uh, cellmate. His cousin just ran it to me and verified it again. He goes, "No, he's he's done. He just stepped well, out." There's, of there's another there's another guy that did the same so, thing. Yeah. The two brothers that were, were close yeah. to Patty, Sally, uh, Sally, and, and Avellino. Oh, Avellino. I know the Avellino. Yeah. yeah, I know the son. He kind of retired himself yeah. too. So you know they're allowing it now because it's a different different life, different era. Right. And it's a this different never would have got yeah. And, and well, it's a lot guy. of it I heard from is from Rico too. Yeah. Rico, well, Rico, Rico killed him. But he's a guy. So you saying Patty so, did fifteen years? So, 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 I mean, so he did a lot of time. Yeah, I think he, he, did. he did a little more than that, but he did at least fifteen. And when guys are walking away, they're understanding. You know what? I'm done here. It's over. He had health issues, mm -hmm. so you know that a contribute. So you know it's probably a little easier for him to walk away than the next guy because he had health issues and he. And I'm just assuming he he's might thinking, have health issues again. Hold on. Yo, this, this, I'm gonna, I just gotta say, this is amazing. I'm, I'm with Frank almost every day, and I know he got a whole bunch of shit in his head. I just don't pick sometimes, you know what I mean? But damn, I learned a lot. Y'all wanna hear some Black Wall stories? <laughs> <laughs> some black people. That's, a, that's another show, my <laughs> friend. Right there. I can tell you my name. I'll tell you about Crackhead Sal. I told, I'll tell you about him. <laughs> I stay with a lot of black gangsters all my life because of where I come from. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in, you know, on, on the south side of Jamaica. I was there a lot, and I was in East New York and Brownsville with my friends. I, you know, I talk about these guys all the time. You know, listen, and Frankie will tell you, you know, because we've been around and he's been around forever. A gangster is a gangster. A tough guy is a tough guy. Mm -hmm. The religion or their color doesn't make that man. That's right. So when someone's talking about whether it's Bumpy Johnson or you're talking about the fat cat and those guys in Bumpy South Jamaica, Johnson, that's a or you're talking about guys that grew up with TT and these guys in, in uh, Brownsville, these are street guys. And, you know, so I always say the same thing. You ain't fooling a street guy. So when, you know, I get into politics a lot where they're trying to divide people and bullshit people. Yeah. And they're kneeling down for George Floyd when they could give a shit if George Floyd died 20 times over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always get into because guys from the street understand, you know, that's bullshit. You know, it just call bullshit. it what it is. He shouldn't have died, but when he... When I was up north, I got plenty yeah. of crackheads but we should from, have, from know, white guys. That I ain't have, no, they, they would help me more than my brothers would help me wait, in prison. The, the funny that thing ass. about... By everybody in this room, mm -hmm. you've reinvented yourself. Yeah. You took this, whatever you did in the past. I, I'm a big believer in second chances. So whatever you did in the past doesn't make a difference. It's what you're doing today. Right. John, well, what you do today, you go out and you speak to these these young kids about losing portions of your life. Well, I'm going to tell you something. And I, and, and I, and well, that's what you're doing? Something. That's yeah. what's up, Yeah, I, I speak, uh, I go to high schools, colleges, juvenile centers, I talk. But what I want to finish up is George Floyd is no different than us, right? That's we right. did some bad things. Mm -hmm. We didn't We didn't deserve to die by a, a bad cop's hand. Yeah. But it still doesn't make us heroes. Right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. He, in my eyes, I feel bad that he lost life because I was just like him. Mm -hmm. But he shouldn't have statues of him. Statues of Martin Luther King Jr. Statues are of uh, Marines that have fallen for this country. It is a difference, right? I don't believe that, again, I, I don't believe he should have died, just like some of the beatings we caught and things happened. Yeah. And, uh, but when when our politicians are kneeling down for him, 
and they're trying to con us. Come on. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. stupid enough to believe this. That's yeah. where you guys should. You guys really want to. Yeah, yeah, you guys really want to be gangsters. You should have been politicians. Yeah. I hate to tell mm. you. Oh, they're the real gangsters. But you, but, you do the the mobsters versus mo- so you've reinvented yourself oh, a I, totally I, different listen, way. I, I've been reinvent. I've been reinventing myself my whole life. Yeah, yeah. I see. You know, like I I evolved. But before we get into that, I just want to say one thing. We we talk about these stories. Yeah, they're funny jail stories. But there's nothing glorious about it. And that life is really a treacherous life, and I'm happy to be away from it, you know? And and I would hope that anybody listening, if they're in that life or thinking it's good or, and it's the greatest thing, it's really not. Frankie. You know, it's it, not. It, we know, like, we're yeah. joking about it, and it is fun. Yeah, so we had a yeah. ball together. We were all friends. But we're not telling the parts when you're crying in those cells. We're mm-hmm. not telling those parts when our families. Members are sick with cancer, or people died, or one of our friends got killed on the street. We're not telling that part. Yeah. You're not Who's telling it? the part where you're sitting alone at night after thinking about the things that you did on the street, and I know it affected everybody. I know it does, because you're human. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely, you think about a lot of your past at times. And like, like for instance, let's, let's go back. Like, I was 22 years old, convicted, with, with a pre-sentence report with life. And now I'm sitting in my cell and I'm like, my whole life's gone. You know, but because of Greg Scarpa being a cooperator, we did get a second chance nice. for a technicality. Yeah. Nice. You know, Loopholes. You know, well, and I, I don't want to cut you up, but I'm going to tell you one thing and you can go into it. I was diagnosed with PTSD and you do something and work with something oh. with PTSD. Just tell us about it after well, you finish. Well, ju- just recently, like I'm friends with these retired law enforcement individuals. You're um, friends with one right now. Yes, and I just have a new friend, <laughs> and, and and they're a great bunch of guys, and they put together, they have a radio show called the 99% Radio Show, and it's all made up of, of retired law enforcement and military veterans, and they made like a little motorcycle club, and they all stick together. They're deep as and, hell. And they, they are deep. They're in all kinds of different countries and different chapters, and they really are a close bunch of guys, and they, they showed us, myself and a couple of my friends who I met them through, Nothing but love and respect. And I did a podcast with them a couple of times. I did a live uh, meet and greet with them in Texas. I'll do anything for these guys. They're a good bunch of guys. And there's an organization called Walk the Bridge, Heroes Memorial Park Bridge, where all these first responders and retired military and law enforcement all you know get together and they walk this bridge in honor of all the uh, military first responders and law enforcement who committed suicide from PTSD. And it's an organization that lets other, you know, retired law enforcement or active first responders, military, you know, active, non-active, that there are people they can talk to about their condition so they don't take their life. So this is, this is the point where it draws us together. And I'll tell you why. Right. So I, the reason I'm retired is because I was involved in a police shooting. All right, nearly took my life. Screwed me up so bad where I've had multiple suicide attempts. Um, My my wife, I don't know how she stayed with me. Uh, Go from zero to 100. Shout out to her. Shout out to her. Absolutely. My wife's name is Tricia. Couldn't sleep. I wake up so wet, you think I'd piss myself. Mm. And this is, again, I don't care what you guys did in your previous life. It's, It's what you're doing right now that... Shows me you got a good heart. You were trying to earn for your family, and a business is business. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had a cop coming in and and infiltrating, business is business. You know, as long as it wasn't personal, there was no entrapment or anything like that. And that's what people got to look at. They got to look at where you are presently and where you're going to go in the future and how you're going to take your message forward. And I know, because I really want to get into what you're doing right now as far as mobsters versus monsters, but we're going to save that for another show. Because we're coming up with another show with you very, very shortly. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Yeah. But I do want to. We do got to wrap. Up. I, well, we'll wrap it up here. You have another podcast for the people that don't know, suffering podcast with you and and Mike, your yes. partner on that, who was also an ex police officer and also had issues with shootings and and yeah, uh, yeah PTSD. PTSD. Is but I wanted to say one thing before we go. At the Walk the Bridge org is the organization, and just you know. Sp- you know, Google it or just go right to it and just read about it, talk about it, and, you know, support it. Because I support it, and I made a PSA for it. We'll put that in our show notes. Okay, good. 
I'm going to put it in the people out there yeah. that listen to this. This show is about uh, unity, not division. It's pro-police, pro-America, pro-veterans. And uh, anybody that wants to look for us, please look out, subscribe, and uh, listen for the next show that we have you guys on. We'll talk about mobsters and yes. monsters. Now, mobsters versus monsters. And, and, block, and mob block. Okay, right. I got two projects going on right now. One is a reality paranormal TV show called Mobsters vs. Monsters. Don't give away too much. I'm not. Leave, leave the cliffhanger, bro. Okay. And another uh, project called Mob Block, which is a movie that myself and Castro are, are directing, producing, doing everything ourselves, editing it, soundtrack to it. And basically, it's a, like a, a modern, urban, hip hop mob movie. We, we, so we got to jump we, in there yeah. with that. We don't no, want to make it hip hop mob movies. You guys. It's, and, you and, feel me? And, yeah, yeah. We don't want to make a hip hop mafia mob movie. You, you go. Remember Cribs? Every every Cribs, every rap yeah. every rap yeah, star yeah. they went into Scarface or some other mob yeah. movies playing on the TV. So it's, yeah. it fits very well. How, how do guys find you and find you guys? Cash okay. Yes. 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 Uh, on Facebook, uh, Mobsters vs. Monsters. You know, ask to join the group and I'll let you in. You can read all about it. And uh, Mob Block, it's uh, not finished yet, but what is out is the soundtrack. Yes. Which is fantastic. Which, which is on iTunes. Yes. And it's on the Castro Zaytana. And the album is called Reasonable Clout. Reasonable Clout. And track six on that, myself and Castro are on that together. Called Cruise. And the song is called Cruise. And the video will be dropping real soon to the world. Yes. I want to drop it here for you guys, too. Yes. Then we'll, that's what we'll do. And I, I'm, on, I'm on Instagram, uh, Castro underscore Zaytana. You can find me there. You know, yes, right and there. I'm on Instagram too, Mobsters vs. Monsters. The black right. Italian, you know? I'm <laughs> at Real Kevin Donaldson, and of course... True, at... true John Elite. Uh, JohnElite.com on the website. If you want to hear anything about these guys, or you want to know anything about my bats, signatures, cigar line. Cigar line, so we got Belladama cigars here. Well, put, put Elite 10 in there. And before we go, I see you got that watch. Oh. What the... is that? Oh, that's that's our sponsor. Oh, that's the right? Vincero. Vincero. That's Vincero. the Vincero. That's, that's the Vincero. Vincero. That's Vincero. So, Vincero's wearing the glasses now. I yeah, like yeah, yeah. Oh, you got so, the glasses. So they make watches and glasses yeah, yeah. for men and women. So I got to. I like up, the black ones. Yeah. I got to step up my game because it seems like every person John knows is dressed to the nines. And uh, listen, I'm just. A, I'm just <laughs> Shout out to Vincero in the building. Vincero's in the building. <laughs> Any information you want to know about the movies, their shows, the new series I did, Nordic Narcos coming out. It's all on the website. It'll give you a calendar. Follow us. Look out for these guys. And, we'll and be thanks back for soon. having us. Thanks for having thanks us. For having we'll us, be back. Thank we'll you. be back. Thank you. Thank you.